Yeah. Uh, just I said the one, two, three, you can start. All right. Okay. One, two, three. Hello, this is Lucas Carrotson. I'm calling on, or I'm uh, starting the show today uh, on behalf of Telugu NRI Radio. I uh, hope everyone has had a wonderful week so far. And, uh, you know, we're joining today uh, to have our Wednesday uh, program. Uh, you know, to recap, our program is here for uh, anyone who might have questions that need to be addressed or any topics that might be of interest. Um, we do have a pre-scheduled uh, topic list that's been on uh, our Facebook Live page. Uh, so any additional topics that anyone wants to discuss, please go ahead and message us or call in. Uh, and we can go ahead and address those issues or questions. Um, also want to uh, mention, you know, this past week there's been some news. So we'll go ahead and start off uh, explaining some of the new updates that we have uh, for uh, this week. Um, here recently, this uh, past week, um, we received notice from Department of State about the upcoming visa bulletin. And there's going to be a few issues uh, this year with... Uh, you know, expected uh, movement on the bulletin. So we were expecting, you know, this October, there would potentially be a, a movement like there was last October. Uh, but unfortunately, that's going to be delayed uh, in, in part due to the, the backlog that's still being processed uh, at this moment with USCIS. So Department of State will go ahead and uh, there is going to be uh, visas that are going to be reallocated from uh, family-based to employment-based. Uh, but the process of filing these cases are, are going to be much slower than they were last year. So as we all remember last year, there was, uh, you know, drastic movement and, you know, 200,000 extra cases were filed, um, you know, due to this backlog. USCIS is still struggling to go ahead and file uh, and process these cases this year uh, before September 30th. So uh, we don't lose any of these visas. Uh, it looks like there are going to be you know, a few uh, thousands, tens of thousands of visas that won't be issued in time. Uh, but what I think they're going to do for this upcoming year is to roll out the, the dates in a much more controlled manner where every month there's only going to be X number of maybe 10 or 20,000 uh, expected applications to be sent in. So we'll see continued movement throughout the year. It just won't all be at one time. Uh, and so speaking of that, uh, from what Charlie Oppenheimer said, uh, we're expecting possibly uh, the September dates uh, to remain pretty much the same moving into October. Um, you know, we'll still see maybe a month or two movement from time to time. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I think this next year we'll see continued movement throughout the year. Um, that's. Uh, primarily what, what we're anticipating at the moment. Of course, a lot of things can change between here and there. Uh, another update is, uh, you know, there's been some talk uh, about potential uh, movement for premium processing for H4, H4 EAD visa holders. Uh, that uh, was done for rulemaking purposes, uh, I think a week, week and a half ago. Um, you know, we're still waiting to hear officially what's going to happen with the commenting period uh, still being open. Um, if anything is implemented, uh, typically we're still looking at four to six months uh, window uh, after that rule is adopted. So in the long term, it's a possible solution to this backlog and, and uh, wait time that we currently have. Uh, in the short term, it doesn't really, you know, fix anything. Uh, you know, we, we're still trying to see if what uh, avenues there are for that. Um, it, at this time, um, you know, obviously something, uh, an option that's there would be for uh, filing uh, H4 EAD uh, mandamus cases, uh, utilizing litigation. Uh, we, and we have a few of those cases that are currently pending. Um, these cases, you know, uh, pretty much are going through the court to, to you know, for the, the court to help process the cases in a faster way uh, where the, the court will, issue, you know, tell the agency, USCIS, to go ahead and hurry up and file the cases or approve them. Um, 
and you know we can discuss that a little bit further in detail and other than that, that's pretty much uh, for our introduction this week. I think that's pretty much uh, catching us up. Uh, going into a little bit more detail, if anyone has any uh, comments or questions, you know, to start the show off, we can uh, see if there's anything uh, to open the discussion with. If not, we can go into more detail about uh, maybe potential GC filings of what to expect uh, this fall. Um, for people who currently have a GC application pending with USCIS, uh, there has been a lot of discussion too about uh, notification for uh, medicals uh, to be processed and sent into uh, USCIS. Um, there's been a lot of questions both on the show and at the office about uh, intra-filing. So if we didn't file your medicals uh, with the uh, at the time you filed your application, that you would have an opportunity to file uh, now uh, and have that in your file. So when your fi uh, priority date becomes uh, current with the final action date, then you could go ahead and not have any delay in your case processing. Um, or you could also wait until you receive an RFE from the service center uh, to forward the medicals at that time. Uh, we do want to remind everyone that one of you uh, file for your medicals that you need to go and uh, visit USCIS.gov webpage. Uh, you'll say find a doctor and you can enter your zip code and find local doctors that are authorized by USCIS to uh, issue the uh, medical uh, evaluation. Uh, also, uh, I think we wanted to discuss this week uh, a few other trends. Um, the most notably, uh, what we want to discuss this week uh, is uh, some good news in the sense that we have this infrastructure package that has passed the Senate and has been sent back to the House. And when it went back to the House uh, representatives to be passed, there was some amendments that were allowed to be attached to this bill, uh, which, you know, bode well for immigration. Uh, specifically, the, there's uh, provisions available that we can include immigration-related bills or, or laws into this uh, infrastructure bill. And what that means is in the future, uh, 51 votes in the Senate are all that are required with the parliamentarian's approval for any uh, major change. So it, it will fast-track any potential change that we might have. Uh, uh, if everyone remembers, Venkat and I spoke about the proposed bill that uh, was, you know, hopefully going to be uh, implemented for comprehensive immigration reform a few weeks back or a few months back now. And as a part of that, we were discussing also that there would be a piecemeal approach to how this these laws would be implemented, these changes. Uh, we both discussed it um, about how you know, these uh, DREAMers or, or DACA visa holders would probably be included first, along with, you know, uh, H-2B uh, visa holders or uh, maybe even TPS uh, recipients. Uh, and eventually it would grow to include, um, you know, employment-based backlog issues. Obviously, the employment-based backlog issue is something that's easier to put through because, um, you know, there's more positives, I think, politically for that. So I know a lot of people I've seen on Twitter and uh, Facebook, a lot of people are frustrated, and, and rightfully so. It's a frustrating process to have to wait to see these visas that are available and not being issued at a fast enough pace to meet the deadline of, of September 30th. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to always keep a positive mindset for what might happen or what could be and not focus only on the negative aspects of the process. Uh, and, you know, I've, we've seen a lot of comments where people are frustrated and, and you know, rightfully so, uh, having to wait for multiple, for 10 plus years to get to the uh, point of even being able to have a, a green card. So uh, what we can do is, again, after this process moves forward, we can, uh, you know, reach out to local congressmen, uh, senators for your state, and, uh, you know, make sure we let everyone know how important this is for us to include, um, you know, employment-based backlog issues 
with this new uh, bill that's going to go through. And, and hopefully two things can happen this year. Number one is that obviously there's going to be a, quite a few more employment-based uh, visas allocated from the uh, family-based side, which we've already discussed. And the, number two, that there's going to be a comprehensive immigration reform that reduces or eliminates uh, per country uh, limits uh, on a yearly basis, or even uh, additional visas being allocated to, you know, help address this backlog we currently have. So those are two things. And, you know, it, it's important to not focus on what other people might receive before uh, you receive. Uh, at the end of the day, it's we want to make sure the whole process is complete and addresses the needs of everyone uh, equally. Um, so that's it's primarily for what the current information is for this week. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions yet or if anyone wants to uh, have a topic to discuss. They, you're more than welcome to uh, call in or message uh, if, if you do. We, we have um, uh, the, the floor is open to have that discussion this week. Uh, also, um, I think we wanted to maybe discuss uh, the H4 uh, EAD litigation. Uh, this is something that, that our office has been uh, has introduced and has been filing for uh, a few weeks now. Uh, we've had some positive results uh, in filing. Uh, and just for anyone who might need uh, some more information about this subject, uh, what we're doing is we're filing lawsuits, mandamus lawsuits against USCIS uh, and other government agencies pretty much saying, you know, the delay is is uh, impacting the, the person who's applying for this benefit. Uh, under the law, it pretty much says that anyone who qualifies for the benefit and uh, pays the fee required for this service that, you know, that uh, there shouldn't be any impairments or anything uh, inhibiting them from being able to get this benefit. So, you know, one of the reliefs we have available for anyone who pays for the service is to go ahead and file through the court where we have, uh, you know, a, a judge that can uh, tell with a court order USCIS to, to take care of a, you know, and approve a case or take action on the case within a certain specified period of time. Uh, so someone, so there's some finality with that matter. Um, typically, the way this process works is uh, we will go ahead and file a lawsuit with USCIS. Uh, once we file the lawsuit, the clock starts, and there's 60 days uh, that the government has to reply to the uh, lawsuit. Typically, in the 60 days, what we've noticed or what we can expect is that the uh, assistant U.S. attorney will reach out to us to try and uh, resolve the issue so the case can be dismissed. And what we're basically doing is during this 60 day window is working with, you know, the U S attorney, assistant U S attorney, uh, to be a liaison more or less to try and help get the case moving. If that's not successful for any reason, or if there's a reason to proceed further through the court, the government will file a motion to dismiss moving forward, which obviously we would respond to. And then typically, uh, within four or five months, the judge would make a decision based on that. Once the judge makes the decision, uh, typically things are, uh, you know, if we, if we win that motion, uh, typically USCIS will move quickly to have the issue resolved. So the, typically um, the most common solution to this problem or this type of case would be uh, the case being resolved or approved within the, the 60 days after the filing. Um, other than that, uh, I think we have, I don't know if we have any, uh, here we have a question here. Uh, do we expect uh, the dates of filing moving, let's see here, past uh, November 21? Uh, for 2017, probably not 2017 for filing date. Um, I would expect this year, the whole fiscal year, there's a potential, there's a possibility we could get to 2017. Uh, but at the time, I think what we're going to see is incremental movement within the filing period. So 
what might happen or what probably will happen is October, November, um, the dates will move, but not at such a large clip as they have in the past. And what we'll see is a response from USCIS to see how many cases have been filed. And obviously, uh, Department of State and USCIS will coordinate the filing dates uh, moving forward. So another key uh, factor uh, I want to remind everyone of is whenever we're filing uh, adjustment of status based upon the, the filing date with the, with the visa bulletin, it's very important to look at the filing date on the visa bulletin itself, but then you also need to check USCIS. USCIS will have their own uh, filing dates that they will accept uh, based upon the, the visa bulletin. So sometimes these dates, let's say it could be uh, October 2011, uh, EB2 for uh, country of India for filing date. Well, USCIS, based upon their workflow, they might say, well, we'll only accept any case for March 2011 or earlier uh, to be filed. Uh, so this is a key number we need to look at uh, moving forward in uh, October and November of this year. And if we see the dates progressing uh, at a four, five to nine month uh, movement each month, it's very uh, real possibility by the end of you know next year and next summer, we could be you know at the end of 2016 or somewhere in 2017. But to know exactly um, how fast that moves is something no one knows at the moment. We would just have to wait and see. I can tell you this, that this year there's going to be even more uh, visas reallocated from family-based to employment-based. But the big problem we have is how fast can USCIS process these cases? You know, at the end of the day, USCIS is not going to hire additional people. Uh, one could hope that you know, maybe some of the work would be uh, balanced out with other service centers where, you know, right now, uh, instead of the National Benefit Center, maybe there's other service centers that could help process this, like maybe Vermont or California, Texas, Nebraska. But, uh, you know, at the moment, there hasn't been any changes or plans to do so. Um, you know, and, and this is all something that's very much uh, move, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving on a day-to-day -day basis on how they're going to address it. This is a uh, something that doesn't happen normally uh, in this. Obviously, we're learning our lessons from last year uh, with what happened and how inefficient that was. And so changes are, are being made to try and make it where the inefficiencies are still uh, re reduced uh, as much as possible. I know a lot of people are still pending and waiting on uh, their advanced parole and uh, employment authorization documents that were filed last, uh, last year for downgrades. So um, let's see if there's any, if anyone has any uh, other information. Um, other than that, um, I don't want to see if uh, Thinkad, if you had any uh, points or comments that you wanted to make uh, or the topics we needed to discuss this week. Yeah. Hi, Lucas. Yes, I have a couple of uh, questions uh, segment wise. So first we can go for the adjustment of status um, process. So uh, d did you have a call with the uh, State Department? Maybe Hila had a call with the um, Department of Status for the for adjustment of 485 process. Uh, it meant 2020 adjustment of 48 process. What do you think is still uh, maybe Texas Service Center is not giving, is not releasing, maybe it's not um, um, printing the EAD cards. Do you have any information how much time it will take? Or maybe is there any, um, is there any information on that one? It means most of the, most of the applicants are waiting for the EADs for the um, continue to the job and uh, for travel outside of uh, United States. Because of this, uh, most of most of most of uh, is a uh, uh, stuck between. So, if you have any information on this one, or maybe if if we want to expedite process, what is the best way to expedite the process? Recently, um, maybe if you expedited the process 
just for the financial loss or maybe job is ending the so and so days, uh, I think USCS strictly is denying the expedited process. Is there any other way to to expedite process and get EAD or uh, advanced payroll? So that's a very good question. Um, you know, typically the process works on a FIFO uh, system, first in, first out. Uh, we we've discussed, I know, on your program here that typically, you know, once biometrics are ready to be scheduled, uh, they're scheduled in a city in an area uh, where the, the applicant lives. So if you live in Dallas, obviously we have a lot of people here in Dallas. There's going to be more demand for this appointment. But if you live in a state maybe with less demand, maybe in Nebraska or Kansas or something like this, the local field office where you would go for your biometrics uh, is probably going to have fewer uh, people lined up. So it's going to be a faster process. We have to also remember here, you know, whenever you do schedule this, there are other visa categories where people um, – process it you know faster so we have you know maybe a son or daughter um i'm sorry a, a parent of a u.s citizen where the son or daughter applies so that's gonna be in a different category of a where they would be an immediate relative uh husband wife so those priorities uh for immediate relatives are usually you know going to process the case a little bit faster um there, as far as expedited requests, uh, you can go ahead and make the request. You can call the 1-800 number uh, that's on your receipt um, and, and make the request at that point. Uh, usually, you'll receive an email following up from that request uh, to submit additional information, which you can. Um, you can also uh, possibly, um, I know that there's one a uh, person who is filing some litigation cases in regards to uh, processing these GCs, which also would incorporate the um, H4, I'm sorry, the uh, GCEADs. Uh, as far as how successful that would be, I wouldn't, I, I don't know if, if that's going to be a proper solution at the moment. I think all we can do is um, maybe use the the what's available to us in the sense that we could you know, maybe make that expedited request uh, on the phone line, um, a, uh, you know, moving forward. But other than that, you know, this is part of the problems we were discussing a minute ago that there was such demand last year and such movement on the visa bulletin that all these applications were filed at one time. And all that has done is caused a tremendous delay in processing. And so it was very inefficient. And as much as we were all expecting this year for things to, you know, maybe mirror last year's movement or, you know, uh, give more opportunity to uh, later priority dates um, for filing this year, I, I think that what USCIS and, and the um, DHS has come back and said is like, you know, we can only move at this fat at this rate. Uh, so I guess that what they're what they're going to do is to do more of a, a piecemeal approach uh, to see what they get every month. So instead of getting 200,000 cases at one time, you know, in October to process over the entire year, I think this year what they're going to do is to say, OK, we'll take 10,000 extra cases per month, but spread that out over, you know, the whole uh, year. Um you know, and hopefully that's more efficient where we don't have such huge delays, you know, because if we all remember last year, we it took until February really to get receipts for all these cases. Uh, so there's a huge problem with a lot of these uh, cases. Uh, and hopefully this year, whatever approach is used uh, moves the uh, filing dates faster and, and more efficient. Okay. So... Uh, I think uh, once we apply the 485 adjustment of status, we should not travel outside until we get the advanced payroll, right? That's uh, correct. I I've had a few people, obviously, this past year uh, that due to family emergencies with the parents, uh, maybe having bad health or expiring, um, had to travel. And... You know, obviously, any of those circumstances or situations, uh, you have to uh, evaluate uh, um, independently. Uh, typically, the best course of action is to stay here until you you finish the process, or at least have advanced parole. 
Uh, and advanced parole pretty much allows you to travel and uh, have everything in place to come back in. It doesn't always guarantee that you will be readmitted uh, to the United States, but it does help uh, smooth out that process. So even if you have a non-immigrant visa stamp, this will help also in case there's any issue with that. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen unprecedented uh, health issues uh, and we know families are on the other side of the world at the moment. Uh, and and it, first and foremost, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you and your family are, are healthy and safe. Uh, and right now, any travel, um, you know, on an airplane for more than a couple of hours is, is going to put you at risk or to be contaminated with the virus. Um and so it's, it's, a, it's something each person has to, to measure and weigh at the moment. Uh, and that's first and foremost, that's the most important thing is everyone's health. Uh, so if you come to the conclusion to travel, just speak to your attorney, uh, your employer, try and make, make sure you have all your, everything planned accordingly. Uh, so there's no issue or at least it's the least amount of problems that you, that you might incur, encounter. Okay. The same scenario, I have a couple of questions on this one. The first question is, Let's say if anyone fall in this situation, if they come back to the United States, when they should want to start the process and uh, waiver, maybe kind of waiver, it means by default to 485 adjustment step, uh, status will deny, maybe abandoned. So for these kind of scenarios, do we need to submit a uh, document as soon as reached to United States or just we need to wait until USCIS respond, respond that? So that's a very good question. Um, in the past, it would be ideal maybe if you did uh, uh, notify the office or do an interfile, you know, with maybe an updated I-94 or something like this. Um, at the moment, and this is going back to another question in regards to medicals for interfiling, uh, is with so many cases being processed at one time, it's very difficult to uh, if you can think logistically, there's every every person's application goes to a, an actual file. So with that file, you're trying to uh, match any additional evidence coming in to that file. So if if there's an issue where the papers don't make it to the file, or if there's some other issue where um, your file's being sent to a field office and and your enter file was sent to um, you know, the service center is still working on it or the National Benefit Center. Um, you might have an issue where there's some delay or, or what you want to update never arrives. So, you know, typically the best course of action is to wait to get a notice in the mail. Uh, when you do get a, an RFE or any type of notice, you'll notice it on the top of the page. There's a barcode with the case number uh, for the 45. It'll also have your A number. And when you have that, what it's going to do is uh, it, it, it's a way of tracking or making sure that that file matches up with your your file and um, your A file. And uh, that, that's the best course of action because that that's how everything's sorted and, and processed within the, the government uh, of this agency. Question, oh, question is... I hear in one of the groups saying that uh, in 485, if you've done the biometrics, uh, uh, if can we travel to outside of United States? If you've done the biometrics, you can travel. Yeah, after com yeah after completing the biometrics, uh, if can we travel to outside of uni United States so that it will not impact the 485 adjustment of status or something? So typically, if, if you um, travel like that and, and the, everything's updated, if there's a, re a requirement for you to, to have an updated biometrics, you'll receive an RFE for that. Um, there's nothing you know, that grants any travel permissions or anything else based upon whether or not you have a biometrics done. Uh, basically, what you're referring to is if you'd be exposed to you know, tuberculosis or any other uh test any other disease that you're tested for previously you probably have to be retested at that point so 
numbers. You know, yeah. you something for you need to travel. It's it's best if you make that decision. You know, get it based upon uh, your family in that situation rather than just if you've completed a medical or not. Okay. So, the one question is um, maybe in four eighty five. I one forty. We already discussed a lot of time, and uh, just I want to check with you. Uh, same downgrade EB2 to EB3. The still it means it's been almost ten months. To, it means as 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 Indian immigrants, uh, we new to the downgrade process EB2 to EB3. So we did we downgraded EB2 to EB3. Now it raises the questions the same way. It means we have the two types of or three types of uh, uh, process in downgrade. One is amendment. One is a the second one is the reclassification. So the same, it means we, I asked the question, I asked the before also, I'm asking again, if downgrade application I-140 denied, whether EB2 will exist, 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 exist or not? Uh, I mean, it, sh it should still be uh, available. Also, even if um, you were to withdraw the current downgrade, and let's say your EB2 date becomes current or something like this, that's also something that, that would be there. Um, what you have to remember is whenever you're processing these cases, so your, your first EB2 case, uh, theoretically, if it's there, it's already been approved, the, the job offer's made, it, and if, if something happened to the downgrade, you should have the opportunity where you can still file a supplement J or something like this for the other physician to you know that's still there uh that that would uh show that the you know meet the requirement that you know the offered position is still there and the employer see, is continuing to be willing to process that uh, petition um and you should be able to bridge that so we see this more common um in family-based cases okay so we see this often a lot. Let's say you have, you're you're a citizen and you apply for your brother or sister. Well, typically those categories, the fourth family preference category, is the longest uh, wait time for, for anything. Uh, and what we see most common is if I have a, a pending case, and let's say I think for for like Mexico, for example, right now for fourth preference category for families is 98. Okay, or 99. It's, it's it's something. It's over 20 years. Uh, so let's say I also petition for my parent. My parent eventually becomes a citizen, and um, now my brother or sister has a parent who's a U.S. citizen. Well, that moves the visa category up many, many years, maybe 10 years, and they would then, you know, uh, move upgrade, so to speak, uh, to a different uh, visa category in the second. Uh, preference uh, um, or third preference, I think, for for married center. If you're married, uh, just depends if you're married or unmarried at that point. Um, but it, it would put you in a different uh, category with a with a date that's more that's closer to becoming current. So when we do this, when you when you're moving from one to another, it's not to say that the first petition is denied or anything if your subsequent petition is, is denied. Uh, it, it just allows you to maneuver within the visa bulletin itself to different categories. Um, some people are very focused on filing, as you mentioned, uh, you know, a whole separate case, a fresh petition, so they have two actual uh, I-140s that are, are usable. And I think that's the wrong method of thinking. I, I think the best way of doing anything, especially with these downgrades, is you're utilizing a, a, a labor that's previously been approved and, and you're just taking that EB2 and you're changing it to EB3 visa category. Um, at the same time, if, if another situation arose and you qualified, you could upgrade to EB1 uh, with a different process. You could use that priority date, uh, but you'd have to file a whole new petition. You'd have to have all these other factors adjudicated. If you downgrade right now, you can always upgrade back up to EB2 without having to go through all these additional factors. 
So there's a lot of things that are that are there that that's a more conservative approach to make sure uh, you're you're kind of uh, staying with that one case without risking uh, any loss of processing or or time of process. If that makes sense. Yeah, here a little bit confusion and uh, assuming that if you if you mark as an amendment while downgrade EB two EB three, it means so the current EB2 is downgraded to EB3. If anything happened in EB3, the both uh, the I-140s will affect. Let's say if you, if you reclassification while down, down the process, if um, deny the EB3 or if anything happened in EB3, but still EB2 still exists without any issues or something, this is uh, the most of the applicants are assuming this kind of uh, uh, interpretation. So here we have the little uh, confusion. I, in one more thing is, so if we want to apply the new I-140, we should have have to have the labor validation, right? Without uh, uh, labor, the validity we cannot apply as a new I-140 application. Is that true or? So a uh, labor can be reused. Um, on an I-140 if the I-140 was filed and a decision was made. So what that means is if the labor expires and you have a, uh, an approved I-140 or denied I-140, you can still use that labor from the Department of Labor, the ETA form. Uh, that, that's going to allow that to be valid. If you file for I-140 and your petitioner withdraws that case and or you don't file it you don't have the benefit of using that eta after it expires okay so whenever you're talking about using the labor it is long and obviously everyone qualifies for this that has eb2 you already have a labor that was approved for you for this position uh, and as long as all those conditions are still there you can utilize that labor as many times as you need to um, uh, you can't share that labor with someone else because they're not listed in that in that labor itself. So I think there's a lot of confusion about this and a lot of worry where there shouldn't be. I, I think what everyone should focus on, I think we touched on this at the beginning of the show, uh, this is a process and there's always going to be ups and downs with the entire process. And I think what you, everyone should focus on is um, – more or less like what the big picture is rather than the day-to-day because you can drive yourself crazy if one day everything looks good and then you know the next day you read a message board there's a bad message or it makes you think and wonder about this you're going to have doubt for a few days and someone's going to clarify the issue and you're going to be fine it's not a productive uh, way of proceeding with this uh, I think at the end of the day, what everyone should do is realize the number of cases that are filed, the active, you know, uh, processing of these cases uh, by USCIS, and they're trying to resolve this. Um, and and I think to expand on this to to help people realize, I've heard stories uh, where people have tried to upgrade uh, their their I one forty to premium processing. And USCIS has been rejecting that. I've actually re- experienced this myself, where we we did upgrade uh, one person's case, and we received an RFE. We responded to the RFE, and then we were issued a second RFE. Uh, second RFE was exactly the same as the first RFE, so we sent that RFE again uh, back, and a third RFE was issued, which was exactly the same as the two previous RFEs. And what I think in this situation, what you have to realize is not that they're trying to deny the case. When we come across these circumstances is they're, they're beyond capacity of what they can do to process these cases. So what we have to realize is um, any, any time delay or anything else like this or any, any doubt you have in that regards, or if your um, premium request was rejected or anything like this, you have to remember – Look at everything with a big picture here. It's not so much focused on you or your case is going to be denied or anything like this. It's basically we're 
we just have like a, such a large group of people, a historically large group, going through this process at the same time. Uh, USCIS is really trying to utilize the resources to not waste any of these visas that are allocated. So what that means is, you know, they're waiving uh, or reserving the right to call back people for interviews after the GC has been issued. Uh, they're trying to process everything as quickly as possible. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still, you know, a first in first out system. And, and it's based upon how many, you know, resources are available to help, you know, process these cases. And, and I, that's the thing to focus on. Uh, uh, worrying about if I downgrade, if this happens or this happens, it's not going to be productive, you know, for you or for anyone, because uh, I can assure you this, uh, 99% of everyone that's watching this or that we've talked to is going to have a clear path from starting this process to ending up with GC. Always there's, you know, nothing's 100% in life. And there's no 100% guarantee of anything. But for the, for the most part, everyone that's going through this process is going to end up with a positive result. And another example I can tell you is you know last year i think there was a lot of people who had a case rejected um you know maybe a box wasn't checked on a form or something wasn't done correctly and and everything else well it happened to be where that was happening so much because of the delay associated with the uh, uscis accepting so many cases that they act uscis actually said okay everyone could resubmit it's not a problem we'll take rejected packages so even at the end of the day if something bad happens it's not to say that it's it's fatal to your case so uh, i think that's some good points you brought up then cap but at the end of, you know what i would strongly suggest is to say uh you know trust the process let it go through don't be caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh you know message boards and things like this just you know, have confidence you put the case in it's pending and hopefully within the next few months we'll have approvals yeah okay yeah thanks for very detailed information so do you have any information about uh, downgraded i-140 approvals do you see any i-140 approval in, in normal process a normal process um I haven't seen any yet. Um, I think the most important thing is to realize uh, the way USCIS is trying to work through this problem is uh, issuing as many green cards as they can before September 30. So what they do is USCIS, you have to remember, everything works on priority dates. Everything's prioritized by the priority date. Now, a lot of people, in fact, a lot of the cases I've filed, um, we've upgraded to premium processing. Uh, I-140s have been approved in that process. We, you know, we've had a few RFEs, like I explained to you earlier about, uh, you know, I think it's more of a, a pain of the processing times with so many requests. Um, but it, as far as anything else, I mean, it, you know, it's not going to speed up your GC any faster or slower so as far as like if you had a regular processing uh case but your priority date was on the border of eb2 and eb3 being current and now it, it is current i think you know the the i i-140 is going to be adjudicated faster than if you have a regular processing i-140 that you know is at the end of 2014 or whatever it might be um that that's uh, just common sense of first in first out based on the priority dates um you know that that's the most important factor to consider um i think that did i address your question correctly yes so that's why it means most of the is, uh, are confused because we don't see any uh, progressive so everyone is waiting. It means we are hearing the wastage of green card numbers and uh, we are not getting the GC EADs and advanced payroll. The most of uh, most of H4, H4 EADs are um, the, the pile of, uh, we don't see any approvals. 
So here, one question about the uh, H4, uh, H4 process. If we apply the H1 in premium process, did you see any, uh, did you see uh, approvals in one bundle, H1 and H4 and H4 EAD in single bundle? Unfortunately, no, I haven't seen any. Um, in fact, one of the cases we're handling for litigation uh, spoke to one guy and he, he was actually pretty clever. He, he tried um, to go ahead and file uh, the H4 extension with his H1 and premium. Once H1 was approved, then he tried to file EAD after, and it didn't really help do anything. All it did was split the case into two different service centers, which probably uh, doesn't help much. But, you know, it's such a mess right now. Uh, whenever the requirement was made for biometrics, it, it caused such a change in processing and a, such a delay that you, you already have a backlog of thousands and thousands of cases and now even if this new program is supposed to help speed up there's still backlog uh, of other h4 cases so um it, it, i don't know what to say i, I don't I, I would imagine that you know pausing the biometric requirement would have uh you know helped speed it up somewhat but it, it hasn't i haven't seen any evidence of that yet okay so, uh, Lucas, I have a one scenario um, about uh, the H1 application validity and I-94 validity. Let's say I apply, f uh, I, I, I applied for extension. I got the two years of extension. Let's say January first to and December, January first to 2022, Gen uh, December 31st, 2022. Uh, so sometimes USCS will give the grace period for the I-94. The I-94 validity and H-1 extension validity, it should maybe it might not be same dates. Sometimes it means most of the, it will match the I-94 and the H-1 validity, but sometimes it, USCS will give the grace period, maybe 10 days or maybe 15 days or 30 days. So let's say if any H-1 applicant expire the H1 validity is still in the grace period on I-94. If the applicant apply in last day of uh, I-94 expiration, do you see any issues, any issue on, uh, and any consequences on this one? Uh, H4 already expired, right? Before already H1 status already expired, but uh, had a I-94 validation for 10 days. So, if any person applied in grace period, will did you see any or did you see any case uh, in previous? Uh, typically, no. Um, we usually reply apply you know for extensions uh, before then. If there is any oversight or anything like that, where someone forgets to file, we can always file maybe a non proton request uh, to fix that issue. Um, Typically, I mean, mistakes are always made. Uh, so even if you're six sig six sigma, that's ninety nine point nine 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 percent accurate. But if you factor that in times hundreds of thousands of applications, you're still going to end up with some uh, issue of a mistake. Uh, so typically when you see the dip, the discrepancy on the the grace period on the h1 you have a i94 that allows you to uh the dates where you have you're authorized to work on that and then you have a grace period to you know when to depart um you know typically the h4 should always match that um i mean i'm sure there's certain circumstances and now with the cases being separated i'm sure that might be more common uh uh, I have been seeing quite a few RFEs where, let's say, you have your H1 is approved, and then let's say, you know, eight or nine months pass, we'll get an RFE uh, asking for the H1 approval copy. Uh, maybe that helps them to see. Uh, maybe they don't have access to that because there are two different officers working on that case. Uh, you know, maybe that's why they need that to help match up the dates, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, if there is an issue, just contact your attorney or 
uh, you can reach out and ask us. We'll be more than happy to answer a question if, if, if you're concerned about that. But there are remedies if the dates don't match. and uh, Maybe you ex- go over by a few days. We, there, there's things we can do to mitigate that, that issue. Yeah, okay. So already you explained the visa bulletin, uh, October visa bulletin. Uh, in, 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 what do you think about the final action date? Let's say is a filing date. Maybe it might go to maybe not. Maybe we cannot expect. The same as a 2020 October, but do you expect a final action date will move the next uh, October and November? Yeah, I, I think so. I think what we've seen um, is I think the best way of visualizing this is last year we had so much movement. There was all these cases put here at one time and we're asking USCIS to sort through this and work on all of these at the same time, which is very ineffective, uh, which we've learned uh, this year. I think USCIS is going to do uh, more or less a windows like moving at a, at a consistent pace. So what, what we don't know, what USCIS, USCIS does not know is how many people are going to file. So let's say uh, EB3 right now is, I think, Jan 2015. So let's say it goes to Jan, uh, from Jan to September 2015. Uh, which it might not even move that much for filing date. Uh, what USCIS is going to do is to analyze and see, okay, how many people filed uh, in October? They're going to take that number and then they're going to say, okay, here's November bulletin. We cannot, we can either uh, move back the dates and scale it back a little bit because we can only process or handle X amount, or we can accept more so that it might move faster. It just depends, and I think that's the, the approach that they're taking this year. So uh, I think everyone should not be disappointed when October comes out, the days don't move that far. Uh, remember, it's a process this year. I think it's going to be piecemealed uh, throughout the year, and we're going to see movement all the way up until uh, October 1st of the following year. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Maybe you can share if you have any additional information for this week. Uh, I think we covered all the major topics. Um, we do want to encourage, you know, anyone who's watching or watches this after it's alive, uh, post on a Facebook uh, live. I'm mean, sorry, on Facebook before we go live next week or YouTube. Uh, let us know of any topics or concerns or specific uh, circumstances or issues that you have with your case. Uh, maybe we can address it for everyone here. Um, obviously, uh, any feedback is is much appreciated. Uh, also, want to you know let everyone know I appreciate the opportunity to have this platform. Obviously, Vincad uh, Telego NRI Radio. Uh, it's a it's a valuable platform we have here to share information and help the community with any issues that come up. Um, I do want to just end on the note that you know. Um, Everything uh, that you go through with this from when you first get your uh, H-1B visa to the GC to citizenship to whatever you want to do, everything is a process, right? Uh, it's, it's a key to be patient. I know, you know, everyone wants things to happen quickly, but every, in life, things seldom happen quickly. It, it, everything w- worth having takes time to have. Um it's important to also not to get caught up in too much of the highs or get caught up in too much of the lows. Uh, remain, you know, take everything with a grain of salt with what you're doing. Uh, if the dates don't move to where you expected or wanted them to, don't get too distraught or upset about it. Uh, eventually, everything's going to work out. And uh, uh, what I would do is just recommend that everyone, uh, you know, take this uh, as it comes and go forward from there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we can we can uh, connect the same day every Wednesday evening, six p.m. Central Time, and same time and uh, same platform. So until we can we sign off and uh, we will catch next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, today 
live show with uh, Lucas Garrison, USA immigration attorney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.